well, you've had a long-standing interest in Greek mythology long before this collection, and many of these two-figure poems engage on one side with a Greek figure. You've talked about how Greek myth has been an obsession of yours since you were a child, that if someone had asked you in elementary school what you'd want to be, you said, a professor of Greek mythology. And you've said that in some ways these myths are more constitutive of the way you process the world than the Catholicism you were raised with. But both in your interview with Dorothy Wong at Bomb Magazine and explicitly in the poems themselves in this new collection, the engagement with Greek mythology isn't just because they're rich, evocative stories that have subsequently influenced so much of culture and art and your own life. But, but returning to these two figures, I think of Emily Wilson's translator's note to the Odyssey, where she talks about the Greek coinage of the word xenia, their concept of hospitality, and also xenophobia, that Greekness is defined in relation and often in opposition to the other, to the non-Greek. And like Wilson, who suggests that the rituals of Xenia are employed as a means to extend empire, you look at Greekness in relation to both their own colonial aspirations and their racial self-conception. And I was hoping maybe you could talk into that more for us, the, the functional role Greekness is playing in From From. Yes, and I love that you're bringing Emily Wilson into the room because talking about that last poem, the poem ends with a translation, my own translation of the word pacifai. Uh, Emily Wilson is someone I know very slightly from uh, from Yale. And so I kind of bounced it off her. I'm like, is this legit? Can I say that pacifai means this? And she said, absolutely. And so I felt validated, I guess. But, but I also think that she has a deep understanding of the context and function of Greek myth. It's not like these figures were always white statues. In fact, they never were. That was not their function. Um, I think... The Trump presidency made me think a lot about the myths that people tell themselves and the centrality of the idea of nation or national identity to myth making. And that was true for the Greeks, as it has been for many other cultures. What is Greekness? And a lot of Greekness is defined as as Greekness became more complicated, became more widespread, as the Greeks started establishing colonies, and as they started worrying about influences such as the uh, worship of Kybele or the Egyptian mythos coming into Greek religion, a lot of Greekness starts to become defined in opposition to an Asian other. And the myths become somewhat obsessed with thinking about this idea of Asia. Asia is a Greek word. We treat it as if it's somehow more neutral than the word oriental. It's the same thing. Asia for the Greeks meant that place over there where we have colonies. Mm. And the content of what is in that box that is called Asianness has changed. They were referring to Phrygia, to Turkey, to parts of present-day Georgia, to Armenia. And now we think of the focus of Asianness has shifted more east and southeast and south. But that idea was always there. And a lot of the figures that we consider to be taboo or dangerously alluring and sexual and magical and dangerous in that way, the, you know, the witch queens, the Trojans, the Thebans, the, you know, all of the sites of taboo fascination for the supposedly rational uh, Greeks are Asian and would have been understood as Asian. I wanted to ask about the construction of asian in From From in relation to your own self-conception over time. Long before this book, you've talked about growing up deracinated, that your parents, who came before the 1965 Immigration Act, were an early wave of post-Korean War immigrants who were very much striving for assimilation. Your parents seen model minority as a positive thing, their social circle being other Korean engineers from the same elite private high school in Korea, that your brother didn't learn to use chopsticks until college, that you grew up in a white part of Houston where you'd be the only Asian person in your classes, and perhaps most notably growing up in the South with a racial binary where you were either not white or not black and your family chose not black. I know you've engaged with the feeling of being deracinated before this book in multiple ways, maybe most notably in your quote unquote Twinkie poem, Gold Acre from your last book. But if I didn't know your history, if I didn't know this about you, if I came to From From ignorant of it, this book feels like it is the work of someone very assertively racialized with a self-conception of their own identity in relation to race that feels very nuanced and dynamic. The book very provocatively and actively places us in a racial dynamic, regardless of the race of the reader, right away, which sort of begs the question for me about the story or journey for you. For instance, when you say in the acknowledgments, thank you to my fellow members of the Racial Imaginary Institute for their profound influence on my thinking about race and art making, I notice myself wanting to construct a narrative about how you've come to this point of writing from from, which feels like a fully embodied and, and confident engagement with 
really difficult questions of being Asian in America. Um, not that you weren't confronting race before. You were, I think. But it feels, something about this feels different to me than even your most recent book before this. I think that's right. I think I was doing a lot of self-searching, both just as a sign of the times, uh, partially as a result of the birth of my son, who was mixed race, and partially as part of my curatorial work for The Racial Imaginary. In thinking about the construction of my identity, you know, it's very hard to write about an empty space without filling it. And, you know, deracinated identity for me is an empty space. It's an empty space that is contained in a shell. And the shell is the interface with whiteness, right? The interface with whiteness, also the interface with other racial identities, causes you to be defined as Asian without the, you know, without the guts of it, right? Without the deep connection to homeland or belonging that... I feel that other people have access to and that I never have. Um, you know, growing up in the South, people um, in ways that are deeply binary and deeply racialized nonetheless have a connection to place, to homeland uh, that I have never felt and also have kind of senses of community that, you know, I experience only in very small ways. And so thinking about how to write that shell in a way that makes both the external pressures and the internal emptiness somewhat palpable was, I guess, for me, the big challenge of this book. I mean, writing a book about deracination is very different from writing a book about identity. It's what people, for example, in talking about the work of Teresa Hakim Cha, um, will refer to as the poetics of difference versus the poetics of identity. Um, identity meaning sameness, meaning I'm the same as these other people. That's not a feeling I feel very often. Well, the first poem, which you set apart from the others, the one you referred to, Study of Two Figures, Pasifai and Sato, even though it is a long poem, I think we should have you read it because it really is almost like a thesis for the book as a whole, setting us within a certain atmosphere and an ideologic space. So something maybe you could introduce us to the two figures if that's not too much explaining before reading it. Um, and then if we could hear that opening poem that feels so vital to everything that comes after it. Thank you. Yes, unfortunately, I remain one of these po poets who require extensive endnotes, which is something that Jeff Schatz, my darling editor, has been <laughs> eye rolling about since the very beginning. Um, you know, now there's an internet, so people can look up certain things for themselves. But you know, I also want the book to be accessible, so I do still include the endnotes. So the first figure in the book is Pasiphae, who is um, the wife of King Minos of Crete, and she, um, you know, the story is that the gods send a white bull from the sea, and King Minos is supposed to sacrifice the bull. He doesn't. The gods become angry, and they decide to punish him by punishing his wife Pasiphae by making her fall in love with the bull. And she asks the inventor Daedalus, who is then working for them, to uh, construct a wooden cow. She crouches inside the cow, is impregnated by the bull, and gives birth to the Minotaur, who is then later killed by that avatar of Greekness, the Hero Theseus. You know, the thing about Pasiphae is she is from this family of witches um, out of Colchis, um, who are sometimes known as the Daughters of the Sun. Um, Circe is in her family, so is Medea, so if you, you know, go down, is Phaedra. Um, and these are people, figures who are thought of as magical, taboo, and Asian. Um, and then Prince Sado is from 18th century Korean history, and he is the crown prince, and he has a famously stern father, and he gets married to this woman named Lady Hyegyong, who is amazing, and from whose memoirs we know his story. And at some point, he becomes insane, and he begins killing and raping courtiers. Uh, by some accounts, he killed up to 100 people. And there's very little that the king can do about this problem without creating a crisis for the succession. Uh, because if he kills Sado um, as a criminal, then the entire Sado's uh, son, the you know the grand heir, will become you know will become illegitimate or tainted. Uh, the same will happen um, if he's declared insane. Various other stigmas will attach to that house. So what the king does is he asks for a rice chest to be brought, and the rice chest is just what it sounds like. It's a box. It's about four foot by four foot by three foot. And he asks Sado to get into the rice chest, and he binds the rice chest with rope. He puts grass on top, and about eight days later, Sado dies. So this is the poem. Study of two figures, specify Sado. One figure is female, the other is male. Both are contained. One figure is mythical, the other historical. They occupy different millennia, different continents, but both figures are considered Asian, one from Colchis, one from Korea. To mention the Asianness of the figures creates a racial marker in the poem. This means that the poem can no longer pass as a white poem, that different people can be expected to read the poem, that they can be expected to read the poem in different ways. To mention the Asianness of the figures is also to mention, by implication, the Asianness of the poet. Revealing a racial marker in a poem is like revealing a gun in a story or like revealing a nipple in a dance. After such a revelation, the poem is about race. The story is about the gun. The dance is about the body of the dancer. It is no longer considered a dance at all and is subject to regulation. Topics that have this gravitational quality of aboutness are known as hot button topics such as race, violence, or sex. Hot button is a marketing term popularized by Walter Kitchell III in the September 1978 issue of Fortune magazine. The term suggests laboratory animals and refers to consumer desires that need to be slaked. The term hot button implies not only the slaking of such desires, but also a shock or punishment for having acted on those desires, a deterrent to further actions pursuing such desires, and by extension, a deterrent to desire itself. Violence and sex are examples of desires and can be slaked, punished, and deterred. Race is not usually considered an example of desire. Both the female and the male figure are able to articulate their desires with an unusual degree of candor and specificity. Both are responsible for many sexual deaths. The male figure says, 
When anger grips me, I cannot contain myself. Only after I kill something, a person, perhaps an animal, even a chicken, can I calm down. I'm sad that your majesty does not love me and terrified when you criticize me. All this turns to anger. Your majesty here refers to the king, his father. The female figure is never directly quoted, but Pseudo Apollodorus writes that she casts a spell upon the king, her husband, so that when he has sex with another woman, he ejaculates wild creatures into the woman's vagina, thereby killing her. Although this punishment is enacted on the body of the woman, this punishment is meant to deter the king from slaking his desires. Both figures are figures of excessive desire requiring containment. Both containers are wooden. Both containers are camouflaged with a soft yielding substance, one with grass, one with fur. Both containers are ingenious solutions to seemingly intractable problems. One problem is political, one problem is sexual. They are both the same problem, they have the same solution. The male figure waits in the container for death to come. He waits for eight days. His son will live. This ensures the succession, the frictionless transfer of power. The female figure waits in the container for the generation of a life. We do not know how long she waits. Her son will die after waiting in his own wooden container. This ensures the succession, the frictionless transfer of power. There are many artistic representations of both containers. The male figure's container is blockish, unadorned, a household object of standard size and quotidian function. Tourists climb into it and pose for photos, post them online. The cramped position of their bodies generates a combination of horror and glee. This, in turn, creates discomfort, the recognition that horror and glee should not be combined, that such a combination is taboo. The female figure's container is customized, lushly contoured. Its contours are excessively articulated to the same degree that her desire is excessively articulated. Artists depict the container in cutaway view, revealing the female figure within, awaiting the wild creature. The abject position of the female figure on all fours, pressing her genitalia back against the hollow cow's genitalia, generates a combination of lust and revenge. This, in turn, creates discomfort. The recognition that lust and revenge should not be combined, that wild creatures and female figures should not be combined, that these combinations are taboo. The tourist can climb into the rice chest. The tourist can pose for a photo in the rice chest. Then the tourist can climb out of the rice chest and walk away. The artist can look into the hollow cow. The artist can render the contours of the hollow cow, the contours of the female figure. Then the artist can walk away. Both containers allow the tourist and artist to touch the hot button, the taboo. The desire and the discomfort remain contained. Both containers allow the tourist and the artist to walk away. The male and female figures remain contained. Neither container, the rice chest, the hollow cow, appears to have any necessary connection to race. To mention race, where it is not necessary to mention race, is taboo. I have not mentioned the race of the tourist or the artist. The tourist and the artist are allowed to pass for white. The tourist and the artist are not contained. I have already mentioned the race of the poet. But to the extent that the poet is not contained, the poet is allowed to pass for white. I have already mentioned the race of the male and female figures. The male and female figures are contained. The rice chest and the hollow cow are containers. The rice chest and the hollow cow are not the only containers in this poem. Colchis and Korea are containers in this poem. Asianness is a container in this poem. Race is a container in this poem. Each of these containers contains desire and its satisfaction. Each of these containers contains discomfort and deterrence. Each of these containers contains a hot button, a taboo. The tourist and the artist can enter each of these containers. The tourist and the artist can touch the hot button and walk away. Each of these containers separates the slaking of desire from the punishment of desire. Each of these containers is an ingenious solution to a seemingly intractable problem. They are the same problem. They have the same solution. Each of these containers ensures the frictionless transfer of power.
Each of these containers holds a male or female figure. The name of the male figure can be translated as, think of me in sadness. The name of the female figure can be translated as, I shine for all of you. I've been listening to Monica Yoon read from her latest poetry collection, From From, from Grey Wolf. So we have a question for you from Claudia Rankin. Excellent. Hi, Monica. Congratulations on From From. It's such an achievement. Um, I was thinking about a question to ask you. And, you know, I was wondering, because this is something I think about for myself, does writing from a point of view that attaches to one's racialized position foreclose any possibilities, emotional pathways or avenues of creation? It's really, you know, it's really a question about subjectivity and writing. And I just wondered your thoughts on that. Congratulations again. I think that's a really interesting and incredibly difficult uh, question, as is typical of pretty much every conversation I have uh, with Claudia, uh, much as I love her. Um, and um, I think that the question of whether a racialized perspective in the poem forecloses kind of possibilities for insight, perhaps possibilities for flexibility, for mutability, uh, really depend on where you think that mutability is going to occur, uh, whether it's going to occur within your own, I don't know, consumption of the poem or your own creation of the poem. For me, I think the subject position is already racialized. I'm not one of these new critics uh, who always seem to me to be completely unrealistic. Um, I always know, and I assume that the reader always knows, that I'm coming to the question of poetic authorship uh, from a racialized position. And for me, in a way, making it conscious or evident for the reader makes it evident for myself in a way that helps me to articulate what it is that I do and do not want to be doing in the process of the poem. For example, in this poem, I did not want to be the exploitative artist who is right, who is you know taking photographs of Prince Sado in the box, who is rendering Asifai uh, in the wooden cow. Um, I do not want to be the tourist who is stepping in and out of those experiences. And especially, I do not want to be the tour guide who is hawking these exoticized experiences. And so for me to make the racialization of myself as the poet explicit, causes me to, I don't know, in a way, uh, further open up what it is that I'm trying to do in the process of the poem. And this might come true even more so in the final poem, which is in some ways a companion piece to this one, in which I am constantly questioning my position as the person who is showing you what is in the container and whether I am at any instance inside or outside of the container, whether I'm part of the exhibition. Yeah. Well, I was excited to see that you were in conversation with Dorothy Wong at Bomb Magazine. Well, I also want to thank, I want to thank Bomb Magazine for so often giving me access to their incredible interviews, which end up influencing my conversations. But I was also excited because when I talked with Sawako Nakayasu recently, I brought up how she had said previously that Dorothy Wong's book, Thinking Its Presence, Foreign Race and Subjectivity in Contemporary Asian American Poetry, had been so crucial for her in showing her that she wasn't as white as she thought she was. And then Sawako spoke to the importance of that book. In doing so, she referenced a conversation I had with Elaine Castillo, where Elaine said, and in this case, she's speaking about dialogues within the Philippine X community, I know that to be part of a family also often means having to fight, and that fighting with your family is sometimes a way of fighting for them. And Sawako felt like that is one thing that Dorothy does. And I think of this in relation to the poem you just read, where the tourists and artists are allowed to pass for white, the tourists and artists are not contained. And in fact, they literally walk away and can walk away. But Asianness is a container in this poem. Race is a container. I think of this when I think of something that Ngugi Watiango says, that our bodies are our first field of knowledge. That if you start from a place of finding that field to be wrong, you don't have the foundation to build from. And also when I talked to Claudia in 2014, her talking about her desire for white writers to stay within their bodies when they write, to write as white writers, to in a sense be contained, to accept containment and not perpetuate whiteness as white space, as universal, perhaps as the ability to step in and step out. Um, but I wanted to read a couple things Dorothy said about your work in this interview as a lead into what I found to be a really fascinating response on your part that I'd love to explore. Her introduction notices, like I did, something different about From From, when she says, Yoon's first three collections are accomplished and impressively controlled with a palpable sense of wariness about them. They can be hard to penetrate, not because of the numerous high culture references to Greek and Nordic myths, Proust, Antonioni, and so on, but perhaps because of a restraint or constraint, which felt, well, racialized. In Yoon's latest collection, From From, something has come undone, all to the good of her. And in that same introduction, since graduating from Princeton, Yoon has had the sort of career that could be seen as embodying a quote-unquote model minority or aspirational immigrant dream. Yale Law, jobs in top New York City firms, Stegner and Guggenheim fellowships, and critical acclaim for her three books. And then she goes on to talk about performing a mastery of knowledge, something I want to return to, because I do think you use this mastery of knowledge in a weaponized way now in this latest book that I, I really appreciate. But your response to her when she brings all this up is to say that there's also a lot of credentialing on the identity side as well, not just on the assimilation side. And you go on to talk about how the only model for you growing up in relation to Asian Americanness was an authenticity model which you couldn't perform, as you've already alluded to, not knowing Korean language, not having spent much time in Korea. And that part of the impetus for this book came from a panel of young Korean female poets at AWP in LA. Uh, and you say, quote, I didn't want to be led down the authenticity path. I wanted to be able to write from the perspective of deracination, more a poetics of difference than a poetics of identity, which you've already nodded to earlier today. But I was hoping we could linger here with what happened in this panel, with what you think the trap of the authenticity path is in your mind, and maybe just a little bit more unpacking a poetics of difference in contrast to this idea of uh, the credentialing that might happen not from trying to aspire as a model minority, but the credentialing that happens in, in sort of asserting an authentic identity. Yes, you see how, um, as a veteran listener of this podcast, I knew to bring a notepad to this. <laughs> I know, you, show, you showed me the notepad. <laughs> <laughs> Six questions. Um, and let me just start by talking about Dorothy, how influential thinking its presence has been to me, to Kathy Parkong, to pretty much every Asian American poet 
I know who was looking for different models. I wanted Dorothy to do that interview because her work on what it means to be a racial marker, what it means to have a racial marker, particularly with regard to um, John Gow, who is one of my most important generative influences and who is also writing from a perspective of deracination, right, of inauthenticity. You know, I don't want in any way someone to come away from either of these two interviews thinking that I am in any way disclaiming the work of the Korean American poets on that particular panel. I adore their work. I teach it all the time. And I don't think that they are performing authenticity. I think what I was responding to was their description of the funding mechanisms that enabled the production of their poetic works, which was they would often get some sort of Fulbright or research funding to go back to their home country and research it in order to be able to conduct a sufficiently authentic performance that it would be, I don't know, um, acceptable to a white consumer, a white consumer or a capitalist consumer who only wants to consume authentic racialized experience in the same way that they only want to consume authentic racialized food. That was what I was trying to steer clear of. This is not my home cooking, and I'm not going to cook it for you. Well, part of why I asked this question in relation to containers and bodies is because paradoxically, I think resisting the authenticity trap, I think, is a way to write from one's body, from one's primary field of knowledge, if we borrow that from Ngugi. Uh, I think of something you said at Cave Canem that during your Texas childhood, when people would say, you aren't from around here, are you? That you had the sense of pursuing your own memories of that time as if you were doing so as an anthropologist with a certain distance because you weren't the hero of your own story. That what it means to be from this place and the stories that are supposed to inform that sense of placeness are not ones designed to include you. That in a sense you're disembodied in relation to yourself. And it seems like one move would be to find an essentialized identity from the quote unquote homeland, even if one has never been there, doesn't speak the language, et cetera. But it seems like it could be paradoxically a more authentic move than the authenticity move to embrace this double space as the primary space, a critical distance from Houston, but also a critical distance from Korea. And it made me wonder, I I would love to hear about that on in its own right, but I also wondered if it's related to the Paul Chan epigraph that opens the book. Is there a direction home that doesn't point backward? Uh, Can you speak to the sense of um, being disembodied from one's own story as well? And is that part of the poetics of writing a poetics of difference? Yes, I think absolutely. And I love that you brought up that quote, which was one that uh, a young curator uh, involved with the Racial Imaginary Institute brought up at one of our meetings um, when we were uh, thinking about nationalism and what that means in terms of identity. Is there a direction home that doesn't point backward? And to be, you know, I think the where are you from from thing comes from the experience of really being two blocks from my childhood home where I had spent my entire life and having someone say, you know, you're not from around here, are you? Um, And feeling like I could either try and prove one form of authenticity or another, but that both would be false. I came to the idea of a poetics of difference through Teresa Hakim Cha. And of course, dicte doesn't start with either English or Korean. It starts with French. And the experience, um, and I think that the French made this experience more physical to the reader, uh, which is what does it mean to be having the performance of this language literally forced into your mouth, literally forced into your body as a, you know, as a process of colonialization? And how can you then speak without also, how can you resist that? without resisting it from a position of authenticity. Now, I think her difference would have been defined as exile, 
uh, rather than to racination. I mean, she was somebody who with, you know, indeed a deep co- connection to a Korean homeland, which in fact, her family had been exiled from for generations, first to Manchuria and then to Hawaii and then to San Francisco. Yes. And I'm interested in the authenticity of deracination, of not pretending like I am coming to a knowledge of Prince Sado because it was a story told to me in the cradle by my mother. It wasn't. It was the a story I discovered through the work of a white novelist um, and not pretending to fluency that I don't have. You know, I'm trying to learn Korean now through Duolingo It's um, and through, you know, Zoom classes. And it's very embarrassing because all of these like middle-aged white women who um, watch a lot of K-drama are much, <laughs> much better at Korean than I am and keep telling me I need to watch more K-drama. So, you know, I don't want to disclaim the attempt to recapture one's supposed home culture that colonial, the processes of coloniality have stripped away from you. You know, the reason I don't speak Korean is because of the Korean War. And I feel like trying to recapture that heritage on behalf of me and my son is an ultimately healthy and enriching experience. But I don't want to pretend that the void isn't there and that there isn't hollowness that I know a lot of other people experience as well. Well, let's hear one more Two Figures poem. I was thinking study of Two Figures Midas Marigold. Okay. And as part of introducing it, I remember on Facebook you expressing gratitude to Kevin Young at The New Yorker for publishing what you call a troubling and difficult poem, and that you were worried that it would be misread, so much so that you tried to pull it at one point. So tell us about the poem and the fears that you have about the poem as a lead into reading it for us. So I had posted on Instagram that I almost pulled this poem. And in fact, I had called Kathy and Kevin and my editor, Jeff, uh, to talk over whether I should pull this poem from The New Yorker. I think my problem was I had submitted it before the Uvalde shootings, and it was accepted a few weeks after the Uvalde shootings. And I know that I myself could not think about a dead child at that moment without becoming incredibly emotional. And I did not want to inadvertently trigger that effect in people. I mean, that was an initial uh, problem. And Kevin and Kathy and Jeff talked me down off the le- uh, ledge, bless uh, bless them. And as far as I know, Kevin is still speaking to me, so this is good. Um, but I think that the other question I had about the poem, which remains a more fundamental question and is inextricable from the project of the poem, which is how do you criticize both the stereotype of the striving immigrant, you know, tiger parent, as well as criticize the actuality of the striving immigrant tiger parent, criticize both the coloniality and the colonized consciousness. And that needs to be a question for me because that, in fact, in fighting with this model minority thing that, as you point out, my life in many ways exemplifies, that is in some ways the question of my life, um, and or at least of this part of my life and of my artistic process in this moment. Um, let me read the poem and then we can continue talking about it. Just for those of you who don't know, just so I can preface it, because I think people think that they know King Midas, they don't know King Midas. Uh, King Midas is uh, from Phrygia um, in uh, Asia Minor. Um, I think according to myth, he was the son of Kybele, this um, Asian goddess who the Greeks were so worried about encroaching upon a purer Greek religion. And, you know, it's not incidental that the myths about Midas, like the myths about Marcius, are myths about the punishment of hubris. Um, And you cannot read that in a way that's inextricable from coloniality. And Marigold is... Only in Nathaniel Hawthorne's version of the story uh, does this daughter appear, Marigold. And I think it's a particularly American move to have the the innocent child, this particularly American version of innocence, uh, manifest itself as Marigold. Study of two figures, Midas, Marigold. Everything he touches turns yellow. We are meant to understand this as a form of death. Death is a wish to improve one's surroundings which is to say to be dissatisfied with one's surroundings is a form of death. To be dissatisfied with one's child, to wish to improve one's child, is to wish its death, her death. The dead child is unchanging, therefore beautiful, which is why we say that death is the father of beauty. He created her, then he created her again. His tears gild his gaze, they harden as they hit the ground. They are a tribute scattered at her perfected feet. Unlike other forms of grief, they are durable, portable, a currency they can be exchanged for other beautiful or useful things. His weighty head lifts, a sunflower at mid-morning. The air glitters with particulate light. He takes a deep breath in, aspiration. A nebula of gold stars swarms into his open mouth. Gold spangles the moving darknesses of his blood, his lungs. Even the rivers in this country pave their streets with gold. I'm listening to poet Monica Yoon read from her latest collection, From From. So I want to move toward talking about my favorite section, which is in a passive voice. But first, I wanted to ask you some questions about poetics. When you were talking with Kaba Akbar for Dive Dapper, long ago before this book, you said something that you've already articulated today. You say, I feel like most poetic questions are ultimately questions of tone. Form ends up being merely a manifestation or expression or consequence of tone. So once I said, I'm going to free myself to be boring and dorky rather than trying to be hip or sexy or lyric or beautiful, then the form could start to take shape. And then Kava talks about how this makes the poems powerful, staggering and surprising because it's a vocabulary that poetry is not familiar with. You give speeches on and are often asked about the relationship between law and poetry. And you often answer by speaking about how metaphor is analogical reasoning. It is what the law is. And that something like Citizen United is built upon three metaphors. Money is speech, corporations are people, and elections are marketplaces going to the highest bidder. And with From From, you've talked about a discussion you had with the artist Nayland Blake at McDowell about the ethics of power language and how they related it to BDSM practices and how this conversation with Blake influenced the tone of your opening poem. And I wonder if you could say more about power language and also how you would describe the tone of that opening poem and of the book, which to me does not seem boring or dorky. It feels analytic at times, but I wouldn't call it either of those. 
Um, but tell, speak more about power language and then how you would describe the tone of the book. Power language for me is the rhetorical power of law, the ability to assert analogy or metaphor as if it were fact. Money is speech. Corporations are people. Beauty is truth. Truth is beauty, right? Um, they're all the same move. Uh, death is a wish to improve one's surroundings. Uh, that's not true. <laughs> that's never been true. Uh, but to assert it in that tone is to make it at least temporarily uh, true, is to freeze the language temporarily into a rigidity that one can build upon, to use the sort of stair-step metaphor that I have been playing with a lot. And this troubles me because I understand power language to be a language that people have differential access to, uh, according to the laws traditionally uh, and structurally drawn by power. And so to be deploying that kind of language evokes an ethics for me. And I was talking with Nayland about this at McTell. I think this might, uh, the first poem took me two days to write. About halfway through the poem, I was like, okay, I've, I've invoked race at the beginning of the poem. I said that race is like, you know, Chekhov's gun is going to come back. I don't understand how race comes back into the poem. And then I swim across Willard Pond and back, and I think race is a container. These are all containers. This is what I now understand about what I've been doing. And this is what I mean about, uh, to loop back to Claudia's question uh, to me, this is what I meant about uh, the fact of making yourself uncomfortably visible as a racialized subject can heighten consciousness of your process in a way that helps develop the work. But this all goes back to, to what I think I'm doing with power language. I'm creating something that is intentionally artificial and intentionally not me, right? Intentionally, this is a game that I'm playing. It is a tone that is relatively less used, I guess, in lyric. Um, I think you could see an instance, a well-known instance of it, for instance, in Lady Long Soldier's 38, that great poem, where a lot of the greatness of it is not in the atrocity that she's narrating, but in her determined attention to the artificiality of her tone, of her syntax, of her discomfort in inhabiting that. We have, at this point, a very well-developed poetics of othering English, of bad English, of Calvinization, of using your bad English, your immigrant English as a weapon. Now, I'm not an immigrant. I do not speak immigrant English. Neither does Lely as a deracinated uh, subject. And so how can we use our fluency to the same effect? How can we use fluency as critique um, to, in some ways, overperform English? I've been trying to work my way toward this talk, which I call proleptic form. Prolepsis in rhetoric is the anticipation of counterarguments in, in advance. It's, it's litigator's technique. In order to be persuasive, you have to anticipate counterarguments in advance. And that's what Lely is doing in 38. She's anticipating the voices that are going to say, hey, you're cherry picking, you're hysterical, you're irrational, you're subjective, you're biased, you know, all of these accusations that are deployed against racialized and gendered bodies. How can you move beyond mere defensive credentializing and make that into its own art form? I think that Robin Cost Lewis is doing something similar in the preface to Voyage of the Sable of Venus, where she is laying out as part of the poem, the extensive processes of credentializing that she's going through uh, to construct this poem. I think that Claudia is often doing something similar uh, in part in Citizen, where the determined affectlessness um, and flatness of the narration is performing tone policing as an art form, right? That sort of defensive uh, maneuver. So I have a talk about this that's currently called something like toward the poetics of self-defense. So I think I have answered your question. I yeah, am now. You've already sort of partly answered my next question because part of why I wanted to start with tone as a first step toward your long sequence in the passive voice is because Dorothy links passivity not only to grammar, but to the stereotype of Asian Americans as passive, as well as to questions around gender and passivity. But I thought of a panel you're on at Poetry Studies now called Poetry Outside Poetry Studies, where you talked about the proleptic strategy used by poets of color. And you brought up in that talk, Lady Long Soldier, Robin Cost Lewis, and Banu Kapil. So I wondered if this exaggerated obedience to certain normative rules to show and foreground the postures that these writers are forced to adopt in the world. I wonder if you connect yourself to the strategy of prolepsis in that section. So there are two different strategies in the book. I think only one of which I would characterize as proleptic. Uh, the study of two figures poems are proleptic. They're often using that extremely authoritative X is Y, therefore Y is Z, therefore X is Z, um, you know, rhetoric that resembles logic, but is not actually logic. The passive voice thing is more more politeness, which I think of as a different strategy, which is more understatement, uh, more trying to make palpable the sort of woolliness of the politeness surrounding you at all times. So it is different, difficult to even articulate something as primal as rage. Well, when you were at that conference that I was referring to, talking about those three writers and prolepsis, I may not be remembering this well, but I thought I remembered you talking about them using passive constructions and sort of an exaggerated performance of following the rules. These are the rules and I'm following them and I'm under them as almost an, an adversarial stance, paradoxically. Yes. You know, and this sort of like obsequiousness has always been a colonial imperative and therefore a decolonial strategy, a deep subversion um, of this. And, you know, I should have looped Harriet Mullen's work into the fold as well. And I think you're right. Um, the careful disclaimer of agency is a hallmark of what I think that this form is. Uh, the no, no, it's not just me and my racialized subjectivity uh, saying this. Uh, there's a more reliable tone that I'm trying to access because I realize that my racialized subjectivity is considered unreliable. Right. Well, as a last form and tone question about in a passive voice, before we dig into the content, I wanted to ask you what you consider this sequence formally, this, this sequence that Publishers Weekly calls a virtuosic performance. And I want to ask this because you're obviously someone who thinks deeply about form. For instance, I listened to a lecture you gave at Warren Wilson on the Petrarchan sonnet, a lecture that you open with a meditation on this really weird necklace that James Joyce 
made for his lover, Nora Barnacle, that includes incomplete phrases of words, which together and separately have different meanings. And you use this as an entryway into the sonnet. And then you compare and contrast Petrarchan and Shakespearean sonnet and talk about how for you, you need more than 14 lines for a poem to be one. And even a 14 line poem with a turn isn't enough in your mind to be considered a sonnet. So in the spirit of thinking about form, before we talk about the long sequence in the book, in the, in the passive voice, I, I wondered if you considered this a prose poem or simply prose or less simply something like lyric essay. When, when Rosemary Waldrop was on the show, this question was a part of our conversation, what prose poetry is and the ways the very existence of prose poetry sort of puts pressure on us to define what poetry itself is. So I'd be curious if you had any strong feelings about how this section is approached, formally speaking, and whether you see this section as poetry and if so, how. I have come around um, after the fact to the conclusion that it is in fact poetry. That was not my intention in starting off writing it. It started off as really a day-to-day -day lyric essay that I was writing, thinking about the roots of anti-Asian hate. And then the Atlanta shootings happen about 10 days into it, and it becomes much longer and much more complicated. I think about the difference between traditional essay and lyric essay as pretty straightforward, that the logic of lyric essay is associational as opposed to argumentative. Um, and I think it verges into poetry where what I would think of as the non-semantic aspects of language get brought into play, questions like cadence and sonic resonance. Now, I think about form all the time in my own extremely weird way. And it's strange because I have no formal training whatsoever in prosody. And now I find myself a professor of English, never really having studied uh, English, except in a weird two-year master's program at Oxford that was almost entirely focused on James Joyce. So I have never done the sort of Norton Anthology, English 101 um, study of English in that way. And so my thoughts about form are almost purely intuitive. And for me, form is functional. A form exists for a function. Otherwise, there's no reason for it. And sometimes the form performs a function and sometimes it doesn't. And I think that's what I was trying to get at with that extremely weird uh, Petrarchan sonnet talk. And for this essay, the form did not start off as functional. And then it became much more functional as we move deeper and deeper into the piece. And it starts to circle back on itself in the same way that a long poem will eventually do um, if you allow it to. So let's hear a part of it before we discuss it. And I suggest a part of it because it's nearly 45 pages long. Um, really long. <laughs> I have turned down multiple offers to, uh, to publish excerpts of this, given it is far too long to publish, um, except in book form, because I felt like I needed space to make the complete argument rather than a partial argument. But I'm happy doing that here because I feel like I'm giving, I have room to contextualize it. Flipping through my writing notebook, I come across a sentence in all caps on a page by itself. You are in no position to criticize anyone. I have no memory of why I wrote that sentence down. Is it a self-admonition? A quote? I entered into my search engine. Just random tweets directed at Madison Cawthorn, at Ted Cruz. Is it something I said? Is it something someone said to me? The anyone in the sentence feels like dissembling. It should be a me, the sentence, a strategy to deflect the perceived attack, to make the attacker redirect their punch so that their fist slams into their own other hand cup to receive it. The sentence assumes that there are positions from which criticism is valid and positions from which criticism is presumptively invalid. Is the stooped, scrabbling posture of abjection position from which criticism is assumed to be valid? What about the position of the one who scatters the grain, of the official harvesters who might be objects of the gleaner's envy, of the owners of the field, of the buyers of the grain? is assumed is in the passive voice. The book writes that Korean Americans were the buffer between the affluent white and often poorer black and Latino communities. The book doesn't explain what it means by buffer. A buffer is something that absorbs a blow, apparatus for deadening the concussion between a moving body and that against which it strikes. As a term, buffer is another construction that leaves it unclear who is meant to be striking the blow, the black and brown against the white or the white against the black and brown? Which is the moving body, black and brown upward mobility or white suppression? Korean Americans were not the buffer for the blow. They were the instrumentality of the blow. They were the blow itself, not the leather glove, but the white knuckled fist. Everyone on the beach, whether walking or standing, keeps their eyes down, fixed on the sand at their feet. When the occasional person makes eye contact, I greet them loudly so that everyone nearby will know I'm American, that I speak English exactly like an American. I am polite. Buff is a beige color, deriving from the Latin word for buffalo. Buffalo hide is a light brownish yellow, hence in the buff, suggesting both the color and the hide. Buff leather was used for polishing, hence the verb to buff. Avoiding eye contact is one of the reasons Edward T. Chang and Carol K. Park give for tensions between the Black and Korean communities on the West Coast in the decades after the INA. The Black community believed that Korean Americans were purposefully disrespectful by not greeting them or looking them in the eye. Meanwhile, Korean business owners viewed their Black clientele with suspicion. Koreans who had failed to assimilate into American culture continued to treat their customers the way they did in Korea where they were taught not to look customers in the eyes or count out change because it was considered rude. The two communities clearly didn't understand each other. 
Who is this passage trying to convince? Who could be naive enough to believe this, that failure to make eye contact was the way Korean business owners manifested their disrespect of Black customers, not by profiling them, not by following them through the aisles, not by crossing the street to avoid them, not by overcharging them, not by refusing to hire them, not by reaching for their purses, their wallets, their guns. A buff can also be a blow from the old French buffet, meaning slap or punch. Rebuff, meaning to reject or criticize sharply, to snub, derived from still another root, the Italian buffare, meaning gust or puff. To rebuff someone is to take the wind out of their sails. A buffet can knock the wind out of somebody. In describing the murder of Latasha Harlins, the book says that Du Sunja accused Harlins of shoplifting a bottle of juice, which Harlins denied. The book omits that Du had pulled a gun on another Black teenage girl several days before. The book omits that the store had a reputation for falsely accusing Black customers of shoplifting. The book omits that Harlins had money in her hand to pay for the juice, which cost $1.79. She had those two dollars in her hand when she died. The book says, quote, that the two engaged in a scuffle in which Dew snatched Harlan's backpack and Harlan's punched Dew in the face, close quote. The book omits that before Dew snatched Harlan's backpack, she called Harlan's a bitch, grabbed her by the sweater. The book omits that Dew threw a stool at Harlan's after being punched. The book omits that Dew's husband falsely reported the incident as an attempted holdup. The book mentions that the news repeatedly showed the footage of Du shooting Harlins in the back of the head as Harlins was attempting to walk away, leaving the juice on the counter. But the book omits that Du was sentenced to no jail time for the murder, just a $500 fine plus funeral expenses and 400 hours of community service. The book omits that the judge in the case, Joyce Carlin, stated at the sentencing, did Mrs. Du react inappropriately? Absolutely. But was that reaction understandable? I think it was. The book omits that the LAPD largely abandoned Koreatown during the uprising, blocking off access to wealthy white neighborhoods and bottling up Black, Latinx, and Korean residents to vent their anger and fear on each other. I stopped reading the book. In April 2012, NPR's All Things Considered asked me to be that month's news poet. You show up for the newsroom's 9 a.m. meeting, you listen as the team discusses what stories to feature in that day's broadcast. Then you have about two hours to write a poem based on that day's stories that you will read and discuss on the broadcast. I'm lucky, I guess, it's a news day rich in tropes and images. The blind Chinese dissident Chen Guancheng escaping from a house surrounded by 24 security guards. Thieves posing as women in burqas robbing a Philadelphia bank. 300 Priuses that had been purchased by the city of Miami found forgotten and rusting in a municipal parking garage. Quantification. The first line I write is about Natasha Harlins, the story that April 2012 marks the 20th anniversary of the LA uprising. But I write it thinking about Du Sunja. How much anti-Blackness Du Sunja must have eaten, drunk, breathed, to have seen an honor student buying orange juice for her grandmother as a threat to her life. Sunja is the name of my mother's best friend who had lent me a diamond tiara for my wedding, a tiara she had bought in the 80s for her newborn son's future bride. Turns out he is a confirmed bachelor. Also, my own marriage recently ended. I think about Du's purported fear, how she must have fed it, nourished it, cherished hopes for it, that it would grow from inkling to actuality, that it would manifest, apotheosize. Fear as congruent to desire, both cut out a hole in the self, then go questing for a shape that will fit that hole, fill it. Like the incomplete circle in the missing piece, rolling along, singing its song. I think of Dew assessing each black face, each black body that walked into her store searching for the shape that would make her fear whole, how she taught herself to crave the weight of fear thudding into the pit of her stomach like certainty, like food. I write the line, fear is the coin dropping into its slot 
I'm sitting cross-legged on the floor in a windowless office. I have 80 minutes left. Quantification. I don't feel capable of being explicit to figure out what I want to say, what I feel able to say about Latasha Harlins, about Dusan Ja, about the LA uprising. I pull up a rhyming dictionary on my phone and surround the line with a villanelle, a guaranteed crowd pleaser. It's a crap villanelle. I think I'll salvage the line about Latasha Harlins, that I'll write a more worthy poem about her when I have more time. That was almost nine years ago. It's been 30 years since her death, twice as long as she got to be alive. Today, a 21-year-old white man kills six Asian American women and two other people at three Asian spas in the Atlanta area. Also today, they rename a playground in South Central LA after Latasha Harlins. Been listening to Monica Yoon read from From From. 